And so we're going to be having two sources of sea level rise in the world. That's the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic instead of just one source. And we better get worried about how fast that's going to increase sea levels. You're going to have an unstable Arctic and who knows what kind of unstable Antarctic we're going to be stuck with. Welcome to Facing Future. I'm delighted today to welcome two illustrious members of our own team, Peter Wadhams, Emeritus Professor and former head of polar ocean physics at Cambridge University and the author of A Farewell to Ice. Mm -hmm. Also with us today is NASA Earth Scientist Emeritus and former program manager for NASA Worldwind, the precursor to Google Earth. Patrick is also a deep sea diver, a pilot, and a certified K through 12 California teacher. Welcome to you both. The equilibrium of our planet is maintained in large part by the polar regions. They absorb heat from the oceans and they sequester CO2. But climate change is bringing stronger winds affecting the upwelling currents and changing the balance of these critical regions, thinning the ice shelves, Peter, we'd love to hear your concerns about the state of the poles. Um, well, I guess my chief concern is about the current state of the Antarctic. Until recently, the Antarctic was sort of ignored because it looked as if it was very stable, that the ice sheets were not changing very fast. And the sea ice also around Antarctica was something which was a bit puzzling because it seemed to be growing while the sea ice around the Arctic is, is rapidly diminishing. So everybody was concerned about the, the Arctic sea ice disappearing and how long will it last before it disappears and, what, and what's going to happen when it does disappear. So the, the, the loss of, of Arctic sea ice was a major concern. But Antarctic sea ice was actually growing in area very slowly, but, um, but growing. And there was no explanation for that. So um, people came up with their own explanations. So um, if, you, if you look at my book, you'll find my explanation for why the Antarctic sea ice is growing, which was simply that the wind speeds around Antarctica have got gone up. And uh, when they go up, the, the, the sea ice actually is thrown thrown out towards the equator, a bit like um, throwing somebody out when they're on a roundabout. Um, it's, it's a sort of well-known effect. Uh, but um, that would cause the, the sea ice to move out to lower latitudes. That will mean that you have a bigger area of sea ice. It's not really that much of an increase in volume, but it's an increase in, in the area. And that's enough to um, to explain the increase in, in in Antarctic sea ice area, and it was a slow increase but real. Now the trouble is um, that stopped happening. Instead of um, this slow but steady increase in ice area, it's now reversed itself very rapidly, and it's going down very fast with. This Coriolis force effect not acting anymore on well, it acts, of course, but it's not it's not doing its thing in uh, causing the the sea ice area to increase. The sea ice area is decreasing because warmer water is coming in underneath the ice shelf and underneath the ice sheet, and that warmer water is actually reducing the the volume in the area of the Antarctic, both the sea ice and the land ice. Hey, so Peter, can you explain where is that warmer water coming from? Hmm. There's greater upwelling, isn't there? Isn't the upwelling bringing cold water? Why is it warmer? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's the, one of the problems to explain that there's, <laughs> there's now there's a whole complex of channels which were unsuspected uh, before and which are now sort of conducting the warmer water 
towards the, the ice sheet. Again, was unsuspected. It's been detected now by various instruments, including this ice in an AUV, Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. It's I've used as very a similar device a lot under sea ice. And it's showing via upward-looking sonar that there's a very jagged lower surface developed for the, the sea ice and for, for the sorry, for the land ice. We so, didn't know that before. We we thought that the ice was smooth underneath the glacier, and now we now this is this ice fin has revealed that it's jagged and bumpy and therefore more susceptible to um attack by warmer waters. Is that yes, it's it's always appeared to be smooth and people have assumed it's smooth. Um, so always the assumption has been in everything concerned with the Arctic and the Antarctic that things happen at a slow and steady pace and we don't have any um, emergencies going on. But the Antarctic events at the moment really are an emergency and it's going to be causing quite rapid changes in the volume fluxes of ice in the Southern Hemisphere, which will be something that we will be noticing via sea level rise, and um, which also seems to now be overtaking the, the changes in the Arctic, because the, the changes in Arctic sea ice are, are happening still, but the Arctic really has kind of slowed down a bit, but the Antarctic speeded up. And uh, the, the two don't go together because they shouldn't be occurring at the same time because it's February. We should be getting sea ice growing in the southern, in the northern hemisphere, but shrinking in the southern hemisphere. And in fact, it's shrinking in both. So the seasons have been, in, in effect, disrupted. It's not winter one place and summer one place as it should be. It's summer, <laughs> both summer. places. Simultaneously, um, and uh, both things are. I'm I'm surprised that to, to hear you say that the Arctic is slowing down because I thought that was accelerating. Well, it's slowing down in the sense that it's still that the ice is still there. I mean, the, the thought or the fear or the assumption was that um, sea ice is decreasing in area and volume all the time in in the Arctic, and so. Before long, it's going to vanish, or it's going to vanish in summer anyway. And we'll we'll then have to cope with all the problems involved in having a, a blue water event where the northern seas become water. And you have to then consider what that's going to do to transport of heat and to the uh, state of coastal seas. But it's, it seems to be hanging on, and this is... The weird thing, which was sort of embarrassing, embarrassing for me because I kept forecasting that the sea ice would disappear and it never did. But what's happening is, is it, it is disappearing, but all over what I thought was going to be going on was that the sea ice would retreat um, and you would get a smaller and smaller area each year. But what seems to have happened is that the area has decreased, but it's decreasing all the year round. Instead of being a summer retreat, it's now a year round retreat, which is gradually shrinking the ice cover, but not shrinking it uniformly. It's, it's shrinking it in a more random way. So we don't know how fast it will be or, or when it will happen that actually you will have an ice-free Arctic in summer. Um, but at the same time, we're quite likely to be getting a very much reduced uh, ice cover in the Antarctic in winter, in fact, and summer. So there's no apparent kind of reason to what's going on just now. And we have to now try to work out how fast the ice is going to disappear and what's going to be happening to, to the, the ice shelves, for instance. We have new ways of, of measuring that we didn't have before. You mentioned the ice fin. Um, there are floats. Are there um, drones that can now go over and tell us more things? Uh, Patrick, you were involved, of course, in uh, Worldview, um, 
what are your thoughts about monitoring these situations? Well, it sounds like uh, the Antarctic got jealous of the Arctic getting all the attention. And so it said, okay, I'm here too, you guys. Um, but I think, you know, as Peter was saying that the Arctic has been warming three times faster than the rest of the planet. Um, and the polar vortex has gone swirly. Um, but now the Antarctic is actually showing that same kind of drama, apparently. And like Peter had mentioned earlier, that we've got, you know, if, if the Antarctic gets lost to the degree that it's suggesting it's going in now, um, this is going to have some very dramatic effects on, on the uh, ocean currents and how those behave. And so the weather patterns across the planet will, as Peter suggested, will go into some kind of mayhem mode. And um, that's what I think is the big mystery is what is that mayhem going to look like um, and uh, where will we feel at first? But I've always thought that the danger we're going to experience, even though this melting ice is going to add some drama to the sea level rise. I mean, this the Antarctic losing this, the kind of ice it's losing now, this is going to dramatically affect sea level rise. And so we're going to have, when storms come, they're going to be doing far more damage to coastlines than historically because of that higher sea level. And I think some unknown drama that Peter's suggesting is that ocean currents, you know, what is going, what is happening to them now, Peter, already that you can tell? Well, there's, there's, there seems to be an, an increase in current speeds around the Antarctic. So we, we're getting, this was the this was actually the same thing as, as people had seen uh, a while ago when when the uh, the ice wasn't growing, but the, we needed an explanation for why was the area going up. And the explanation was that um, you were doing a swirly thing with the uh, currents, and the, the currents were, were then producing a bigger area of sea ice. But there's still that swirly thing going on, but um, it's really the, the, the fact that the actual area of ice is going down rapidly because of the, this the war effect of the warming of the water on the lower side of the ice sheet. Uh, so that's going to be doing, uh, as uh, Patrick says, you know, it's going to be one of the big factors causing sea level rise. Uh, so we're going to be having two sources of sea level rise in the world. That's the Green, Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic, instead of just one source. And uh, we better get worried about how fast that's going to increase sea levels. Where Where is it going to do that? Is it going to, uh, um, to say, uh, cause inundation of, of coastal regions in the Arctic where already you're having to abandon some villages in Alaska because of impact of, of storminess. And you're going to have, therefore, an unstable Arctic. And who knows what kind of unstable Antarctic we're going to be stuck with. So it's very hard to predict actual numbers, although everybody keeps doing it one foot, three feet, 10 feet. <laughs> But, you know, these are so critical for uh, preparing the world to move people uh, out of harm's way. Um, we know there are going to be vast migrations uh, as the world heats up just from heat waves. But sea level rise is, is a huge question and very unclear. And I don't know if it's even possible to, to say with any kind of um, reasonable accuracy when and how much we might be expecting. At the very least, um, we know that it is accelerating. And Dale, as you mentioned earlier, we're losing the underside of the Antarctic, and it's causing this, as you suggested, uh, channeling into places where it's getting that, allowing that warmer water to rise much higher into the the ice sheet there. So the drama is accelerating. So it's not as as Peter was suggesting. The Antarctic's been sort of well behaved. We we suspected. And now it's starting to uh, show the drama that we've been kind of getting used to in the Arctic. But the amount of, of um, ice that will be melted is, is far greater than what's being melted in the Arctic, even though uh, we got to include Greenland up there, which <laughs> is, is definitely 
putting plenty of water in, into the ocean. You know, the other thing too, by the way, is that shifting this planet Earth, shifting that much weight around you know, is also kind of causing probably a, a, an adjustment to the wobble of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing more tectonic activity as a result of the shifting, major shifting of weight. Wow, does that have something to do with this recent terrible earthquake? Is that possibly affecting that? There is no question about it that we are seeing increased tectonic activity. Can we blame, you know, Syria, Turkey event on, on that? Exactly, no. But we can realize that we are seeing greater tectonic activity historically been known. And I'm suggesting, as others have suggested, that this is a result of a weight shift on the planet due to the melting ice. That's a good point. Um, in fact, the uh, the last paper that Sir Walter Monk ever wrote was concerned with this displacement of mass on the planet caused by changes in ice sheets. And he was really looking at that from the point of view of it actually causing the, the average distance of mass from, from the centre to, to increase. And uh, so he just viewed it as a, an interesting problem. Um, who, but, who's, who is this author, Peter? Uh, Walter Monk. Walter Monk, okay. Yes, he's kind of not a, a living god because he died, but he's he's the god of oceanography. And uh, I did a paper with him about this. So we don't have a, a number <laughs> or a timetable, <laughs> really. <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> But, you know, we do need to think about it. And as Peter, as you say, it is the storms. And as Patrick has said, too, it, it you know, the, the surge from storms uh, is going to be affecting coastlines more uh, rapidly than uh, the actual rise of the sea. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's happening already. And the cost is enormous. There's about three villages in Alaska that have had to be completely moved because there's too much destruction from coastal storms now so they have to just move everything and the cost is in the billions it's it's not and this is even for a fairly kind of uh, pathetic looking village that is not not a metropolis but anything like that costs a huge amount to move it well, the storm surge of a recent storm, I mean, just one, one of my favorite places to go near Santa Cruz, California, is a place called Capitola. And that place just about a month ago got hit by a storm and the surge was so high that it wiped out a whole bunch of property majorly as a result. So yes, the storm's effect are going to be dramatic. Big sea level rise, it's, it's enough that when the storms come, it changes the entire historical dynamic of what people have been used to. Well, we experienced that in New York of Superstorm Sandy, which was shocking to us. New Jersey keeps getting flooded um, with storms and people keep rebuilding, you know, build back better, stronger than the storm, all this kind of stuff. I mean, it, it just doesn't seem to be a good idea to be living on the coast at this point in history. Yeah. And insurance costs will go through the roof if it's even available at all. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's that's true too. But I'm I'm always wondering what are we going to do with all the migrants? Where we people are going to have to move vast amounts of people, and we need to prepare for that. We need to have the housing. We need to have the infrastructure. We need to think where is it going to be safer? Where are we going to put people? Or else we're just going to have an incredibly horrible death um, of people unless we, you know, our compassion or our intelligence kicks in and starts to get ready for what's going to happen. Well, we're getting it from both sides because not only are we getting the storm and the dramatic effects of those, but we're also getting the droughts and which is causing a mass migration of people leaving areas where they just can't grow food anymore, whether it's North Africa or South America. So this, this uh, drama of migration um, as a result of environmental chaos has already begun. In some places, there there are restoration projects which are quite extensive and incredible. And you know, we've we've had John Liu on this program quite a bit, uh, talking about these uh, eco restoration camps, uh, mm -hmm. where you know they're actually trying to restore places like the entire Sinai and and so forth. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, what else do we want to say in in the midst of this conversation that we haven't covered? Yes. 
<laughs> the fact that it's ignored by a lot of people. And I I think Florida is probably one of the yeah. crazy places. I, I, I went to the Florida Book Festival to bang the drum for The Farewell to Ice and sold about two copies. Um, and but everybody was ignoring the fact that you're getting sea level rise very rapidly in Florida and you're even getting the sea coming up through the land. I mean, there's a sort of um, a, a rock underlying Miami where water comes bubbling up through it. And so you should be abandoning Miami, but instead people are building sea walls, fixing everything so that their ha property doesn't lose value. Yeah, yeah. increasing the drainage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But well, you know, we laugh, but it's really, you know, it's a horrible tragedy that people just cannot seem to grasp that reality is changing, that there's a the new general, situation the in the world. Psyche, the human psyche is used to linear changes. It's mm -hmm. not prepared to actually account or accommodate or even understand exponential changes to environment. Yeah. That's where we are. Yes, that was a, a very famous statement about that, wasn't it? That was just the problem that humans can't understand the exponential function. Um, but it, it it's true, and uh, it's it's happening in other ways at the moment. When you look at the graphs of, of warming of average air temperatures over the planet, then there's an exponential increase, which is where the exponential is itself increasing, so the slope is increasing. And people sort of ignore it because they they sort of think, well, that's that's really the same, more or less, as linear, but just a, with a bit of extra added on. But if you consider the the actual exponential and how that exponential grows, it's it's going to to be giving us um, warming of a nature that we haven't experienced up to now. Well. We hope that people will listen and uh, take heed of where they're living, but also that people will do everything they can to stop the climate change that's occurring and the massive scale that is occurring, if at all possible, to do everything possible to stop eating cows, to stop using the land in, in stupid ways, to use up the water in wrong ways. We're going to need desperately our resources, our water, and we don't need to keep making ridiculous plastic things. <laughs> but Dale, the ones running this joint are primarily interested in profit. So <laughs> whether it's how you get elected with the big money or whether it's the big money running the show, it's profit, profit, profit. It has nothing to do with, you know, equity or helping humanity, you know, do the right thing. Well, of course, we have to influence the people who run, run the show, the rich people, for example, who have enormous amounts of wealth and power. Uh, more than you know, ninety percent of the rest of the planet, and on those people hangs a great deal. Those rich people think they can ride any wave, you know, whatever they do they to do it, and so they don't yeah. realize that there is a actual place where not even they are going to be safe. Yeah, well, people don't understand they're all part of the planet. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, about that. <laughs> what a lovely thought. <laughs> like Indeed. <laughs> Well, thank you both. Um, I hope that this program is useful in some ways to people and, and is a wake-up call for uh, people who need to hear it. Um, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.